So uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I am Dave, I'm the VP of Engineering at Basis Technology and just a very brief thing to kind of get your head in the game of who Basis is. So we are at the basis of a lot of different folks, NLP stacks. We build a lot of sort of low level NLP functionality, entity extraction, resolution. Uh, we've got classification and sentiment in beta now um, and, and other, um, technologies here that are going to be relevant to this kind of application oriented talk. One of the cool things about being kind of at that, this basis level is we get to see a lot of different verticals, a lot of different uh, how folks use it. And so I'm going to be talking about the sharing economy here. So I'm the second Dave that stood in this place and talked about sharing economy. Dave Holtz from Airbnb uh, talked about it a little earlier on. So sharing thrives on trust. This is a point that's been made a few times today. It thrives on reputation and NLP text analysis has a part to play in establishing that trust. It may not be everything that we need. There's other data you need too, but when you have text, you should take advantage of it. Um, I wanna do a little bit of a history of the sharing economy. So it actually goes back to eBay, right? So back in 2005, when eBay celebrated their 10th anniversary, so now it's their 20th anniversary, they had already found that 135 million people have learned to trust a complete stranger. So the sharing economy has actually been going on for a while, but technology has changed enough to make it accessible to a lot more use cases than just online auctions. And as Dave Holt said earlier today, the key dynamic or a key dynamic of the sharing economy is it's not so much that we have trust for institutions anymore, we still do, but we want to establish trust for our peers. We want to establish reputation. So uh, that has helped um, companies like Airbnb have huge growth and the uh, number of uh, guests that they've had stay, the breadth of uh, places where they have hosts. So there's been a lot of cool growth there. Another uh, sharing economy kind of success story. This is Blah Blah Car, which isn't exactly like Uber. Uber you can think of as more sort of a pseudo taxi. Blah Blah Car is in the UK, primarily. I think they're moving into the US. And the idea there is, you know, I'm driving from Edinburgh to London. Would you like to pay for a seat in my car? And maybe then it's not so much that you just want to make sure that the person you're getting into the car with isn't going to kill you. You might also want to make sure that they don't have like annoying taste in music. It's like that, uh, I don't know if you've seen the rideshare sketch from Portlandia on IFC, but it's kind of like that. Um, so there's a lot of other sharing economy apps that are out there. Uh, so Flight Car is one where uh, you can leave your car at the airport at SFO and someone will, instead of you having to pay for parking, they will rent that car from you while you're on vacation. Uh, neighborhood goods is where you're sharing kind of tools with people in your neighborhood. You may be familiar with TaskRabbit, tasks that are going on. Um, air pooler is you can hitch a ride with a pilot who's flying somewhere else in his or her small plane. So mm -hmm. maybe you can avoid having to play, pay commercial fare by hitching a ride there. And my favorite here is the one in the bottom right hand corner, AirPNP. So AirPNP is if you need to do number one or number two, and you don't have a place to do that and you're willing to pay for it. So actually the closest place right now to do your business in the cloud, um, uh, this is actually one in Boston, there's one over uh, uh, south uh, in mid-market, I think um, like a few blocks away, 250. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty entertaining one. Actually the place that this really got big or as big as it got is for Mardi Gras in New Orleans where you have a lot of you know folks walking down the street who've put a lot in and not necessarily had the opportunity to get a lot out. So. So it's, uh, it's kind of fun to think about the variety of things and what kind of trust would you need to use someone's bathroom, right? Um, in fact, for these sharing economy apps, we sort of think of it as these different uh, apps being at different points of the trust adoption curve in sort of their life cycle. So like AirPNP, you know, those of us that are feeling particularly adventurous, maybe that's the kind of thing that, that we want to check out. But eBay, you know, even grandmothers use e eBay, right? So those safety mavens, they're pretty comfortable. And at least in my view, maybe uh, Airbnb and HomeAway are, you know, a little a little bit past the curve. Maybe uh, blah blah car is a little bit earlier. Doggy vacay. So you could think about, you know, whether you agree with this or whether there are other sharing apps, uh, that, and where you'd kind of put them on this curve. And really think about which of these buckets you would consider yourself to be in. You know, your own risk tolerance for sharing a ride for five hours for someone, or jumping in the back of their Uber, or staying on their couch versus in their, you know, separate apartment. Um, so the point of this talk is about how text is valuable to establishing trust in the sharing economy. I want to start out talking about vetting, talking about um, 
using sources outside of the sharing app to vet and to verify identity. So Dave this morning talked about using reviews within the sharing app and how to establish reputation with that. So I'm talking about using data outside of that sharing app to establish trust even at that initial moment that you've signed up. So there are different sources for this. You could imagine someone saying, well, should we look at your FICO score? Maybe not so great because FICO is about credit history, not so much about what kind of guest you're going to be. Um, offline, so I don't know how many of you have had the experience of holding your driver's license or passport up to your webcam to verify your ID for Airbnb, so I did that. Um, and then also online, so you can you know, link your Airbnb account to your Facebook account and other social media accounts. I think maybe your LinkedIn one. Um, and this in turn becomes a signal of trust in the Airbnb and other analogous uh, apps you know, view of a host. So this is the actual woman uh, whose apartment I stayed in back in February in Puerto Rico with my family, and she had her verified ID. She had linked um, her passport there. She also linked Facebook, so she had some good reviews. So this all helped me feel comfortable in having my wife and two little daughters and I stay uh, at her place. Now, you might want to know, so where does text fit in here? And this is actually something we know firsthand because Airbnb uses one of our text products as part of the pipeline I'm about to tell you about. So when you held that driver's license up to that webcam, what happened? So a picture was taken of that, and the name on that was OCR'd off, and other things about it, like the shape of it and other uh, images on it, I'm sure were sort of vetted to look like, you know, is this a valid ID? But the part I want to talk about is the text part. So the text part, uh, maybe in this case, instead of Jane Citizen, it might have pulled, like, you know, misrecognized uh, the T as a Y here for the OCR. Uh, filter in. Then sitting there on your Airbnb profile, dear Jane Citizen, maybe you actually had Janie and you spelled your citizen name correctly. So this is a case where having something as simple as name matching, actually just like Jeff was talking about for the Ancestry.com case, this is maybe has some other complexities to it. Uh, this is an important capability and it's one that Airbnb uses right now. It was kind of cool when I held my uh, uh, driver's license up to know that my code was running behind the scenes. Um, but you might need to go beyond that. So if Janie's actually a host and she lives in Seoul and the property record for her apartment is in Korean, you may need to go one more step and actually use a cross-language name match. So even something as simple as name matching can be valuable in connecting these different sources of online and offline identities. Um, so uh, I want to talk about what else you could do with text. So not only can you use names to match IDs versus profiles, you might also uh, have heard about this story from last summer about these Airbnb squatters. So a host, her name is Corey, um, had a guest named Maxime, no offense to other Maxines in the audience, um, who uh, actually ended up squatting at her Airbnb uh, apartments for much longer than he had paid for. So here's the timeline. Um, so Maxime showed up on May 25th of last year, and he had made a reservation to stay till July 8th, and he paid till June 24th. He prepaid that. Then on June 24th, Airbnb tried to collect a balance due from Maxime, and that attempt to collect did not succeed. So the host texted Maxime and sa uh, like two weeks after that and said, your reservation is over, I'm going to cut off your power. And Maxime replied, I guess he was aware, this was in Palm Springs, so he was aware of uh, the laws in terms of like occupancy. I think once you've been somewhere for 30 days, if you can show that being evicted affects your livelihood, then there has to be this whole court order that goes through it. I don't understand all the legal details, apparently he did. So he threatens to press charges. Corey takes this to the press, and there's this legal eviction, press coverage, finally he gets out of there. So this obviously, is a case where, you know, not a happy thing, right? This is, if Corey could go back and say, no, you cannot come Maxime, that would be great. Now, could that trouble have been predicted? Well, it turns out the same guy had swindled people on Kickstarter out of $40,000 like three months earlier. Here's the timeline for Kickstarter. So back in 2013, so whatever that is, um, you know, seven, eight months before he came, he, uh, his reservation started with, with Corey. Um, he hit a Kickstarter goal for a video game. 
um, that he was supposed to be working on. So he had two progress updates in November, then one in December, then just one over the course of two months. And then there had been three months at the, on the day that he checked into this uh, Airbnb with Corey since his last Kickstarter update. So what could have happened if his Airbnb account was linked either purposely by his opt-in or by some monitoring of publicly available Kickstarter data? Um, could Corey have seen, well, this guy has a release goal coming up in like, you know, I guess arguably a few days at the beginning of June or at least sometime in June, and he hasn't made an update since February 28th. She might have decided to request the full payment in advance, or maybe she would have decided to cancel his reservation, or at least kind of ask him about that. Or possibly Airbnb, and there's, there's this whole question in the sharing economy of what information do you push to whom when. But possibly Airbnb could have said, oh, well, this doesn't look so great, and maybe they would have uh, flagged something to their own internal employees to kind of check up on Maxine. Now, there's a lot of uh, uh, other uh, names that Maxime actually used through Kickstarter. So here's a Kickstarter backer named Chris Chen, and if you go on, if you go today onto the Kickstarter page for their uh, video game, you can see this. They're like, stay away from this guy. He's using all these other name variants. So if you could have used some kind of text analysis to connect these names across these uh, different accounts, across these different places that's manifesting, you might have been able to, to flag that a bit earlier. So that's, that's another kind of application of text analytics that can help the uh, sharing economy, not just verifying identity, but also connecting accounts and connecting information to try and say, well, if on this site the person's reputation score is going down, maybe we want to know about it over on this other site. So here's another one. And this one is uh, the story is real, but the connection to Airbnb is false. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'm not saying that this guy described in this article actually came to stay, but this is a story about a guy named Terry who was arrested for being a peeping Tom. Now, you could imagine some sharing economy sites monitoring news, looking for negative news about their account holders. So here, and this is stuff that text, anal text analytics can do now. You know, we can find names, we can connect names to database entries, we can learn that Omaha, okay, this guy's address is in Omaha, Nebraska. We can know that a 46-year-old man was born, at least at the time of this article, in 1962. So if you had Terry's profile on whatever sharing economy website and you had a news monitoring service, you might be able to connect those together and look for this kind of negative news and be able to say, hey, you person who has this reservation, here's some negative news. You know, use some sentiment analysis to realize that this story is not necessarily a positive one and especially the way it treats Terry is not positive. So, um, so that's a, a challenge uh, to the sharing economy apps is how do you get this data to connect all together across these, these different sites and I think NLP um, is, is a big answer to that. So there are some, some challenges with this. Obviously, some pieces of this puzzle are, you know, really hard text analytics tasks to do at scale, um, like entity linking, entity resolution, relationship extraction, that's stuff that we're working on and some of which that we have products for, but getting it, getting it really good um, so that it's good enough to maybe cancel someone's Airbnb reservation is a challenge. There's also this question of what to show to users versus the trust and security team at one of these companies. And how to allow users even to indicate their own trust and safety, like when do they want to be notified? What's their own risk tolerance like? Um, and how do you, you know, present this information that says, well, the Kickstarter campaign isn't looking so good? Um, especially in the case that information can sometimes enable discrimination. So we got to be careful that we don't just give people an excuse to, you know, be, uh, you know, be discriminatory uh, for reasons that really aren't justified. I mean. You can look at, you know, this is just one report on Terry. There are other studies that say that subconsciously we have these different biases as much as we hate it. So, um, so these are some, some questions here. You know, if people are opting in, uh, what expectations do they have for the use of the data that they're connecting? If I connect my Facebook account to my Airbnb profile, what, what uh, expectations do I have? And if I do go monitor the news for the people who have signed up with my sharing economy app, or if I do connect the Kickstarter campaign, um, sh should I feel differently about that than if 
the host just went and Googled whoever was coming to stay with them. I'm not an Airbnb host, I'm just a guest, but I don't know, maybe hosts do regularly kind of Google the people who are coming to stay with them to kind of add that layer. Well, maybe they would like the sharing economy app to do that for them. Um, so, uh, so these are some questions to deal with, and they're kind of policy ethics questions, and I realize that's not the main thing we're here today to talk about, but we want to think about that, that bigger picture as well as, as the good deep learning stuff that we're talking about and the other uh, you know, nice text analytics algorithmic business value kinds of questions. So, um, so those are two places kind of where text analytics can come in, both in doing initial vetting when you've signed up with your ID and also providing vigilance when you're looking at news sources, when you're looking at sources on other sites. One other that I think is an interesting place to think about is for these sharing economy apps that, and I guess maybe Tinder isn't quite a sharing economy app, but a place where people more have shades of preference than they do like, no, I do not want that person to stay with me. And to think about, it's almost like you know, approaching, it's like going from Airbnb to eHarmony.com or something, right? What, what are the shades in there uh, for different sharing economy apps that, that you might want to uh, identify? Um, for the blah blah cars of the world where you're going to spend five hours with the person, maybe you want to know a little bit about their personality. Um, so there's this vision in describing character, you know, like the thing on the left, which is, oh, there's, this, you know, just sort of a straightforward enumeration where you can say what kind of person this is or what the connection is between them. But really it can be pretty complicated, like the Enneagram on the, on the right. And um, so it's something that's pretty hard to model. So I'm just sort of putting this out there as kind of a challenge for us. What's the right way to, to handle it? Um, you know, how do we elicit these uh, fine-grained preferences? How do we make those kind of preferences visible to allow people to make informed decisions? Um, and how do we respect those preferences but also not be discriminatory in the app itself? So that's, that's definitely a challenge and not enable discrimination. Um, now you could imagine using text to uh, try and characterize things like uh, sentiment analysis or attribute analysis of the characteristics of the author of a text or expressing it explicitly. Um, and uh, you might combine those using thresholds on different traits, uh, collaborative filtering. There's a lot of things that could, could play in there. So um, in conclusion, what I wanted to talk about was how text analytics can help the sharing economy. So there's things like name matching for doing vetting of IDs. There's things like entity resolution, entity linking for pulling in negative news for pulling in other websites. And maybe even there's things like sentiment analysis or relationship extraction to get those finer grained attributes of character to kind of align with preferences that might be important for some, some of those uh, sharing economy apps. So with that, I'll say thank you and open it up for questions. Great. Anybody want to talk about this stuff? All right. Thanks a lot, everybody.